Please be seated. As Dean of the Divinity School, it is my distinguished honor on behalf of our entire community to welcome you. Welcome graduates, family members, friends, and current students to this graduation ceremony held in conjunction with the 537th Convocation of the University of Chicago. For this year's convocation, we return yet again to beautiful Rockefeller Chapel, a familiar place, this majestic setting for this ceremonial rite of passage. We are delighted to see all of you here together and welcome the graduates and families that are joining us virtually in this auspicious, auspicious hour. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to my colleague, Anita Lumpkin, uh, Dean of Students in the Divinity School, who will add her words of greeting. Dean Lumpkin. Thank you, Dean Robinson. Oh, thank you. <laughs> is it indeed my pleasure to welcome all of you to this special celebration of our graduates? I want to thank the many people that make this ceremony possible. To the staff of the Divinity School, the Office of Special Events, UChicago Creative, and our other campus partners and vendors, thank you. You've been instrumental in arranging and capturing today's events. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. I also want to acknowledge the peculiar set of circumstances that this set of graduates has overcome to get here. Our MA class arrived at orientation two years ago a little nervous. Many of you had just finished your senior years of college online and were unsure about what graduate school would bring. You hung though and bonded over something called the fetish and after a few weeks into it, you had Swift Hall once again alive and bustling. Our MDiv graduates had a whirlwind of experience, going from fully remote to fully in-person in three years. You have truly mastered the art of the pivot. You've learned to listen, serve, and lead in challenging times and in new and inspiring ways. Many of our doctoral graduates achieved candidacy right before the pandemic. And right when you were ready to start your journey, you faced library closures, travel restrictions, canceled conferences, and the like. Yet you persevered. You researched, wrote, and taught classes with kids and pets in tow. And now here you are. Graduates, I've watched you do some amazing things. I've shared in your joys and your sorrows. And I stand here to remind you that you've come, overcome so much to get here today, to achieve this milestone. And we are so incredibly proud of you. The Divinity School faculty and staff delight in your success and cannot wait to see all of the amazing ways that you will continue to illuminate the world. At the end of this ceremony, we invite all graduates and their guests to join us across the street at Idenois Hall and Garden for a community reception. Graduates, you can introduce your guests to your faculty advisor, stop by Professor Hammerschlag and let her explain the fetish, take pictures at the selfie station, and the kids can play at the kids' corner. Dean Robinson will lead a toast to our graduates and we hope to see you there. Welcome again, and congratulations. Thank you, Dean Lump. Uh, the Divinity School has been the graduate professional school for the academic study of religion at the University of Chicago since its founding in 1890. The school educates students in the profession of studying and speaking in an intelligent, knowledgeable, critical, rigorous, and honestly engaged way about religion, a tremendously important aspect of human life and human culture. 
but one which is not always studied or discussed in these terms. The Divinity School is host to a conversation from the widest possible range of perspectives and interests in the study of religion's many manifestations, both past and present, all set within the University of Chicago with its defining values of critical thinking and advancement of knowledge so that life may improve and flourish. To cite the university model, Crescat Scientia Vita Escolatur. Each of our graduates has contributed to, in many ways to this con conversation. We shall now proceed to honor the graduates of our master's degree programs. We begin with the achievement of the MA graduates who will be awarded the degree of Masters of Arts in Divinity by the Board of Trustees of the University at tomorrow's convocation. Will the MA graduates please stand? These students have completed a two-year course of study introducing them to the substance and the methods of academic inquiry into the subject of religion and its multiple manifestations. These graduates, through coursework, language study, independent research, and extracurricular engagement have attained a genuine breadth of acquaintance with the methods of the study of religion and fundamental knowledge in their chosen area of concentration. In recognition of this accomplishment, you, all of you, moving steadily up the, up the line, uh, you will receive the lapel pen of the University of Chicago Divinity School, now your alma mater. Louise Nicholas Alvarado. <laughs> Noah Ethan Avigan. Tamer Aziz. <laughs> Taylor Barnhill. Sherry Ariel Boyskin. <laughs> Livia Claire Boker. Joss Alma Childs. <laughs> Nayeli Elizabeth Gonzalez.
Bareha Mespa Kosho. Esme Nendorfi Fishlin. Pranati Parikh. Katie Lena Shado. Eli N. Simmons. Emma Claire Sternberg. Anna Jane Stoneman. Shay Strelzik. Hadra Zaid. Christine Ann Jung. Please join me in congratulating the Divinity School's 2023 Master of Arts in Divinity graduates. We now celebrate the accomplishments of our MDiv graduates who will be awarded the Master of Divinity degree by the Board of Trustees of the University at tomorrow's convocation. With the MDiv, will the MDiv graduates please stand up? <laughs> These students have completed a demanding course of study toward professional competence in public religious leadership, including coursework on the significance of religious experience, community, leadership, and discourse, attention to practice in the arts of ministry and two attendant engagements in field education, and a senior ministry project and public presentation thereof that represents original research in the arts of ministry. They are trained for the profession of religious leadership in recognition of this accomplishment, you will receive the lapel pin. You, uh, MDiv graduates, will receive the lapel pin of the University of Chicago Divinity School, now your alma mater. Farah Akhtar.
<laughs> Hyatt Vincent Allen. John Jacob Burns. <laughs> Sydney Calloway. Alexa Granda Dava. <laughs> Natalie Robin Delsom. Shraddha Jane. <laughs> Laura Catherine Johnson. Arshan Khalid. <laughs> Emily King. Charlotte Britta Louise Long. <laughs> Shannon Smith Page. Justin Charles Perkins. <laughs> Daniel Sanchez. Haley Dawn Siegel. <laughs> Landon P. Wilcox. Sean Michael Willer. <laughs> Jay Lee Hall. 
Please join me in congratulating the Divinity School's 2023 Master of Divinity graduates. It is now my pleasure to introduce this year's faculty speaker, my colleague and friend, Yusuf Casewood, Associate Professor of Quranic Studies. Professor Casewood's research interests include the intellectual history of North Africa and Al-Andalus, Islamic Spain, Muslim perceptions of the Bible, and medieval commentaries on the 99 names of God. He has several publications, most recently The Mystics of Al-Andalus, Ibn Barajan and Islamic Thought in the 12th Century, published by Cambridge University Press. His current work includes a translation and critical edition of Sufi philosophical commentary in the Divine Names by the Algerian scholar Afif Adin Atilimsani. For the Lubra, Lub, Library of Arabic Literature, published by New York University Press. Please join me in welcoming Professor Yusuf Casewood. Good afternoon, graduates, faculty, uh, esteemed guests. Today is a momentous day in the lives of all who are present here. Congratulations to the class of 2023. Your hard work and uh, dedication over the past few years have culminated in this hard-earned achievement, and it's indeed an honor to be part of this joyous ceremony. As we gather today, I would like to reflect upon the nature of knowledge the pursuit of knowledge from an Islamic perspective and how it can transform our lives individually and collectively. It's been an agonizing process trying to put something meaningful together for this day. So bear with me. One of my favorite hadiths or sayings of the Prophet Muhammad reads, quote, whoever travels a path in search of knowledge God will ease for him the path to paradise. What is implied here is that the pursuit of knowledge is an act of worship. It's a core exploration and search for beauty. And it's complex because God's creation is complex. Note that there's no guarantee that, quote, the path in search of knowledge, talabul ilm, will be easy. It's the path to paradise that would be made easy by virtue of the arduous journey in pursuit of knowledge. Because the mandates of knowledge, knowledge mandates exertion of the intellect and a long and arduous struggle. I'm sure you've had that. It's messy work. It's not just hard. It's agonizing. It's exhilarating. It's depressing, it's fraught with emotions. But over time, you come to realize that the journey itself, that the search is more important than the results. It's about the journey. So if you're looking for the shortcut, you're kind of veering off that path. If you're prioritizing just efficiency or just productivity or just relevance, you're not really on that journey in pursuit of knowledge. Knowledge will change you, and I trust that over time you'll see how studying here has changed you. You should be a different person now than when you came. There's no easy or evidence-based criteria for measuring that transformation, but something in the way you understand, interpret, and make sense of the world has changed. And I trust that you'll continue to understand and appreciate that privilege of having been changed in the pursuit of knowledge and that others will, will see that as well as they interact with you. I'd like to share a personal anecdote that speaks to the complex but enriching path in search of knowledge. When I was in graduate school, I took a year off and spent time studying in a remote madrasa. It's essentially a, a small law college 
located in Mauritania in West Africa. The village where I studied was called Nubaria. It had no running water or electricity. There were about 1,500 residents, a thousand of whom were students or teachers or both. And there was a great erudite scholar called Sheikh Bah, who I would consider one of the top 10 Sunni scholars and experts of Islamic law, who had a mastery of a range, a startling range of the religious sciences. And he presided over this madrasa and was recognized by leading authorities as possessing this type of knowledge, although he had never published any books. And students hailed from all over the world, uh, from literally Thailand, to Nigeria, to North Africa, the Middle East, and everywhere in between. And they were drawn to this tiny village, Nubaria, because it offered this wide range of religious sciences. It was a little city of knowledge. So you could learn advanced Islamic legal reasoning, legal theory, Arabic grammar, pre-Islamic poetry, theology, and so on. To give you a sense of how specialized some of these texts uh, that are studied there are, completing the grammar curriculum in Nubaria takes at least seven years of intensive study. And that's one of many different disciplines. I was just there for one year, so I didn't complete the grammar curriculum. But I enjoyed asking questions to my teachers because it allowed me to understand how these desert scholars juridically reasoned through complex problems. One day, I told a younger student of Islamic law that I had a Christian a friend who was a convert from Christianity to Islam who used to recite the Quranic Surah, a chapter in the Quran called Surah Maryam the chapter of Mary, on Christmas Eve. He had a certain love for the Virgin and wanted to honor that love for her within his Islamic uh, ritual space by reading a chapter from the Quran devoted to the Virgin. The young student that I was speaking to responded that that practice was an unacceptable religious innovation. It was a bid'ah. It's a strong word because celebrating the holy days of other traditions is not acceptable within the legal tradition. There are red lines that have to be drawn and maintained. So you can honor a holiday, but not ritually partake in it. And so that act verged on what was unacceptable. I wasn't fully satisfied with the answer, so I asked a more advanced teacher of Islamic law, who had a decade of Sharia studies on his belt. I posed the same question, and after some deliberation, this teacher of mine, who was from Algeria, he explained at length that indeed, the younger student had a point, it's an unwanted religious innovation because it appears to sanctify a Christian holiday. And he had some nuanced legal proofs to explain not its impermissibility, but the fact that it was discouraged. So he discouraged it, but didn't deem it to be impermissible. And he appealed to long-standing, well-known traditions about the Prophet Muhammad who discouraged his followers, his followers from imitating, quote, the people of the book, the Christians and the Jews. Are you uncomfortable yet? Good. So my Algerian teacher discouraged the practice, but didn't forbid it. Still, I was eager to hear a different point of view or at least another explanation. So I asked the most senior teacher that I could access in the village, Sheikh Mukhtar who had 25 years of very intense legal study and perhaps the most seasoned jurist in the madrasa after Sheikh Ba, that leading Sunni uh, authority in the village. Sheikh Mukhtar, this very senior expert in Islamic law, told me that he wasn't so sure about whether or not it would be discouraged or not, or just permissible. But he felt that reciting the chapter of Mary on Christmas was acceptable but it was just an intuition. He didn't quite have a sound basis for making a non-binding legal opinion. So he said, you should talk to the Sheikh. Talk to Sheikh Ba. By now, this little village is like a little law school. Uh, everybody's very curious about this case. And so it sort of spread around the village. What would Sheikh Ba say to this? 
and everybody was sort of debating it. It's more as a theoretical question, really. This friend who's still reciting the, the chapter of Mary on Christmas Eve doesn't even know about this whole thing. So one day, I had the opportunity to ask the Venerable Sheikh Ba over lunch about whether or not it's permissible to read the chapter of Mary on Christmas Eve according to the Islamic legal tradition. We were having lunch, he stopped eating, he gave me his full attention when I began posing the question. Then after a few seconds of reflection he said, we don't like to be rigid. لا نحب التشدد. This practice is not an unwarranted innovation. It stunned the entire village. Sheikh Mukhtar, the next senior legal expert, was almost pleased and reassured that this great learned Sheikh had confirmed what he had intuited, and he asked about the legal reasoning, and I said, I couldn't, I couldn't get that part. Uh, but the Algerian teacher uh, was a bit more frustrated. The student who had flat out uh, forbade it was uh, almost in disbelief. But they all accept his authority and his erudition. Sacred knowledge across traditions tend to be, tends to be considered rigid and pedantic and narrow. But Sheikh, Sheikh Ba's journey in search of knowledge led him to the most compassionate answer. Erudition and authority at its best is full of mercy and flexibility and humility and wisdom. There's a saying in Arabic that people's knowledge tends to increase, but a true scholar's knowledge tends to decrease over time. In other words, the pursuit of knowledge increases you in intellectual humility, in an appreciation of pluralism of thought and multivocality, and a scholarly life is one that can accommodate contradictory and competing understandings of texts, of scripture, of social reality, of political reality, without compromising core virtues and core values. And it's a process of learning to raise and refine the level of disagreement without collapsing discussions and debates. So never stop learning. Keep an open heart. Keep an open mind. Use knowledge that you've gained to serve humanity with compassion and integrity. Remember the privilege that it is to pursue this path. And once again, congratulations to the graduating class of 2023. May you have a bright and prosperous future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Casewit. Well done. Uh, we will now present our new doctorands, our new PhD graduates. These graduates will be awarded the degree of Doctor of Philosophy by the Board of Trustees of the University. Will the PhD graduates please stand? These doctorands, these PhD graduates, have completed a rigorous course of study in one of the 11 areas of specialization in the Divinity School, including extensive coursework, examinations in modern and ancient languages, comprehensive written um, and oral qualifying examinations, pedagogical training with associated teaching assignments, and the research and writing of a dissertation that has been approved by a faculty committee in their field of study. They are trained as professionals, research scholars, and educators in the academic study of religion. These doctorands, these PhD graduates, have not only pursued, but they have also captured scantia. The PhD degree is a research degree only received with a candidate who has made an original contribution to humanistic knowledge. In recognition of this accomplishment, you, you, PhD uh, graduates, you will receive the doctoral hood that you now have the right to priv and privilege to wear, which uniquely marks you as a doctor of philosophy, graduate of the University of Chicago Divinity School, which is now your alma mater.
Derek Michael Bouillon, Dissertation Chair, Professor Richard Miller, Program of Study, Religious Ethics, Dissertation entitled, We Believe These Truths, American Democracy's Humanistic Political Ethic of Belief. Izette Coban, Dissertation Chair, Professor Michael Sells, hooded by Dean Jim Robinson, Program of Study, Islamic Studies. Dissertation entitled, The Dialectic of Non-Being, Language, Ontology, and Cosmology in the 9th through 14th Century Islamic World. Allison Lee Canner Bolton, Dissertation Chair, Prof Professor Michael Sales, hooded by Professor Sarah Pierce Taylor, Joint Program of Study in Islamic Studies and Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, Dissertation Awarded Honors entitled Maddening Love, Islamic Thought, and the Poetics of Desire in the Legend of Layla and Majnun. Mendel Krantz, Dissertation Chair, Professor Hammers Sarah Hammerschlag, Program of Study, Philosophy of Religions, Dissertation Awarded Honors entitled, The Post-Colonial Jewish Question, Jewish and Arab Entanglements in Post-War France. Elsa Marty, Dissertation Chair, Professor Kevin Hector, Program of Study, Theology. Dissertation entitled, Contesting Context, Adivasi Theology and the Indeterminacy of Context. Kiyohe Mikawa, Dissertation Chair, Professor Brooke Zaporin, hooded by Professor Daniel A. Arnold, Program of Study, Philosophy of Religions, Dissertation entitled, The Cunning of Buddhahood, An Omnitelic Conception of Teleology in Tian Tai Buddhist Thought. Dhruv Nagar, di Dissertation Chair, Professor Daniel A. Arnold, Program of Study, Philosophy of Religions. Dissertation entitled, The Veda's Last Ritual, Grammar, Action, and Embodiment, and and Before Shankara. Diane Elizabeth Piccio, Dissertation Chair, Professor Richard Rosengarten, Program of Study, Religion, Literature, and Visual Culture. Dissertation entitled, A Series of Family Resemblance, Interrogating Hollywood's Trope of the U.S. American Family.
Foster James Pinckney, Dissertation Chair, Professor William Schweiker, Program of Study, Religious Ethics. Dissertation entitled, Rending the Veil, Blackness as Dignity Constructed Through the Works of Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois. John Mark Isan Shangio Jr. Dissertation title, Professor Richard Miller, Program of Study, Religious Ethics. Dissertation entitled, Can Might Make Rights? Dialogical Ethics and the Culture Value Formation in Armed Humanitarian Intervention. Please join me in congratulating the Divinity School's 2023 doctoral graduates. The Excellence in Service to the Divinity School Award was established by the Ministry Committee and Dean of Students Office to acknowledge graduate, graduating students who, I quote, a student who has demonstrated extraordinary commitment and service to the Divinity School community and whose exemplary contributions have substantively enhanced student life. I'm delighted to present the 2023 Excellence in Service Awards to three graduates PhD student Derek Bouyan, MDiv graduate Landon Wilcox, and MA graduate Hadra Zaid, please come forward. <laughs> Derek Bouyan entered the PhD program in Religious Ethics in 2017 after completing the MA here at the Divinity School. Derek is a natural and gifted leader and has served in many roles at the Divinity School throughout his time. He served as treasurer of the Divinity Students Association in 2017-18, GSU representative in 2019-20, and president of DSA in 2018-2019. He also served as assistant director of Craft of Teaching where he was instrumental in transforming the program and in launching the Inclusive Pedagogy Fellowship. He also masterfully helped steward the program through the pandemic and the move to online modality. Next year, Derek will continue in Swift Hall as a teaching fellow. Landon Wilcox, sir, um, Landon Wilcox entered the MDiv program in 2019. He served as co-president of the Div School Students Association and was instrumental in reviving student life in the Divinity School after the pandemic. Landon's warmth and energy created a positive and welcoming environment, encouraging other students to engage with and support their colleagues. His ability to collaborate effectively with both students and administrators have resulted has resulted in greater opportunities for students in the Divinity School. Landon has recently been ordained into Christian ministry at First Christian Church in Virginia and is also a chaplain candidate program officer in the United States Navy. Hadja Zaid has worked closely and collaboratively with the Dean of Students Office and helped to identify ways that Divinity School, that the Divinity School could work to improve the student experience, experience for Muslim students. These efforts led to the school's inaugurable, pro, inaugurable, inaugural programming during the holy month of Ramadan, which included speakers, an interfaith study break, an Eid banquet, 
and an inspiring art installation, installation in Swift Hall. Derek, Landon, and Hadra, thank you. Thank you very much, the three of you, uh, for, the, for your service to our community. We are eager to see all that you will contribute to the world in the years to come. The Excellence in Teaching Award was established about 20 years ago to recognize outstanding doctoral students who have demonstrated a strong commitment to pedagogical development and training, excellence in teaching, and a dedication to student learning. This award celebrates the important role that teaching plays in graduate education and highlights the exceptional efforts of those who have made significant contributions to their students' intellectual growth and development. I am delighted to present the 2023 Excellence in Service Award to Allison Canner botan and Matthew Peterson in person, and to Colin Weaver in absentia. Allison and Matthew, please come forward. <laughs> Allison Kanner botan is completing a joint program of study in Islamic studies in Near Eastern civilization. Uh, has completed, has completed. Mm -hmm. uh, and her teaching, Allison aims to develop uh, the skill of close reading, which helps students cultivate critical engagement and curiosity. Alice per Allison participated in Inclusive Pedagogy Fellowship in the 2019-2020 academic year and the Race and Pedagogy Workshop Working Group in 2021. Allison is a highly skilled educator and received the school's Alma Wilson Teaching Fellowship and taught love, desire, and sexuality in Islamic texts and contexts. Matthew Peterson will soon enter his final year in the doctoral program, and in his teaching seeks to put the traditional theological canon in conversation with contemporary perspectives to interrogate viewpoints of all varieties. By this, he aims to teach students to reach, to read within broader contexts and considered varied interpretations, helping them to build critical reading and thinking skills. Matthew has mentored undergraduate students as the Religious Studies BA preceptor and has completed various pedagogical development programs, such as participating in the Race and Pedagogy Working Group and completing the Divinity School Certificate in the Craft of Teaching in the Academic Study of Religion. Matthew, congratulations. And in absentia, I'd just like to remark on Colin Weaver's achievements. Uh, Colin seeks to turn complex texts and artifacts into lively conversation partners for students and create accessible entry points into the difficult text. Weaver has taught a wide variety of subjects dealing with religion and ethics, philosophy, and environmentalism. He has a robust teaching record and has earned the Academic, American Academy of Religion Certificate in Inclusive Pedagogy and the Div School Certificate in the Craft of Teaching in the Academic Study of Religion. Uh, please uh, celebrate Colin as well uh, uh, in, the, in the virtual world. Colin, Allison, and Matthew, congratulations. We are proud of your accomplishments, and we look forward to all the ways you continue to inspire the next generation of students in the academic study of religion. The Rind Award. The Rind Award was established by University Trustee and Divinity School Visiting Committee member James Rind in honor of his father, who was a Presbyterian pastor and teacher. Each year, the Joseph Gray Rind Award is presented to a graduating Master of Divinity student or students, and now I quote from the citation, a student whose excellence in academic and professional training gives notable promise of a significant contribution to the service of others. I am delighted to present the 2023 Rind Award to two MDiv graduates, Shraddha Jain and Shannon Page, the two of you, please come forward. <laughs> Shannon and Shraddha are two members of an extraordinary MDiv cohort at the Div School. 
a diverse and talented group of students who chose to begin their graduate training at the height of the global pandemic and still engaged in their studies, their field experiences, and their student community with creativity and courage. Shraddha brought her commitment to multi-religious leadership and her gifts for interdisciplinary bridge building to her studies at the Divinity School. At the school's first MDiv student from, as the first school's MDiv student from the Jain tradition, Shraddha's scholarly work spanned the globe between our classrooms in Chicago and our community in India, both figuratively and literally, giving voice to insights from the Jain tradition in a variety of public spaces here. Shraddha's work also crossed over academic disciplines and professions as she encouraged conversations between her communities in the Divinity School and the Booth School of Business, and she is blazing new trails for religiously informed public leadership in her consulting practice. Shannon's work in the program models the life of a learned religious leader. She demonstrated excellence in the classroom while committing herself to robust preparation for priesthood in the Episcopal Church through her internships in chaplaincy and in congregational leadership. The entire Div School community has benefited from Shannon's imaginative and skillful spiritual guidance as she gracefully facilitated the school's open space, our weekly gathering for reflection and contemplation, throughout the entire 2022-2023 school year. Her creative stewardship thought brought innovative programming to our community. <laughs> Shraddha and Shannon, congratulations on your, on your accomplishments to date. We are eager to see all that you will contribute to the world in the years to come. Congratulations. <laughs> It is now my great pleasure to welcome Dr. R. L. Watson, Assistant Professor of English and African American Studies at Lake Forest College. Professor Watson's research interests include African racial culture, African American literature, American religious history, American racial culture, and racial representation in politics. Professor Watson has two monographs currently in progress, The Dark Mask, Moral Metaphors of Darkness and the Representational Lives of Black Americans, one, and two, uh, The Anatomy of Judas, a novel. R.L. Watson received uh, their PhD from the Div School in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Professor R.L. Watson. Oh, wow, it's got my name highlighted up here. This is official. So while I was sitting down here, hold on, I'm a little bit, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody, can you say hi to me? Okay, can you say it like really loud? Okay, I just wanted to warm up the space a little bit because in case, you know, you didn't see it in the program, I'm black. Was that a footnote that was included? I don't know. Um, and I also have just come last week from a graduation of my students the second graduation of my students where I had seen them as undergraduates through their entire process. Um, and it was so beautiful. And it was very, very loud. This, by contrast, is y'all keeping it really, really cute, um, which I love to see, you know, in these august spaces. You see me, I got my fan going, my church fan, you know. Um, but what I want to share with you in the first place is just for you to get an idea of where my mind has been at in thinking about the ways over which I have traveled. The ways over which I have traveled, which of course included a near decade in this place and um, over a decade in graduate study. Um, you know, my students have reminded me that I'm 29. And so, you know, I really was quite a prodigy uh, when I was accepted. <laughs> Hold on, hold on, keep your hand on 
the plough, old horn. So what do we mean? Are we plowing a field? How many of you have ever worked on a farm? Okay, more than I thought. So y'all know what I'm talking about. There's such a thing as a plow, okay? <laughs> I know we look really nice. You know, we don't look ready to receive, you know, horse droppings and other things. But um, there is such a thing as a field. Now, y'all are smart. Y'all know about such a thing as a metaphor. A field that you need to plow, the work that you need to accomplish. And that work is very difficult. What you all might uh, have learned in school, probably some of you had to wait until you had to get to institutions of higher learning to, to know that sometimes people have to be beaten in order for them to plow something that is a field that is really not their own, right? So we call that the, you know, the, there's a word for it that, you know, America, um, you know, I am a deeply American and so I've forgotten that word. Oh wait, no, it, it's called slavery, it's called slavery. Um, and that piece of music is coming from that context, that context in which someone has to plow something that is so, so rough and hard and steep and rocky and difficult, but yet it must be plowed. Life of the mind, life of the mind was a phrase that I heard quite a lot in this place as a PhD student, and I heard it uh, a lot in conjunction with something known as rigor. How many of you have ever heard the word rigor spoken in this place? Rigor, we got to be rigorous. Uh, a graduation gift from me to you, please look up Cameo, Rigor Mortis. It is a song, it is very excellent, and it got me through this place. But this field that we are plowing, it seems to me that if we're talking about a life of the mind, then what field we are plowing might be a field of ideas. It might be a field of theories. It might be a field of suggested solutions or a field of, for those of you coming out of recently completing a thesis, a uh, field of footnotes in the Chicago style, of course. But when we are plowing this field, sometimes it's hard and sometimes there is no rest and sometimes there cannot be any rest. As someone who is 29, no psych, I'm not 29, y'all. For real, I'm an elder millennial. You know, I gotta come out to y'all right here. Um, it's been hard, it's been hard. You know, there were lots of crises and then, you know, by the time you get to be in your 40s, you're thinking, well, you know, I'm gonna make some, you know, enough money that I don't have to eat ramen and rice and beans, even though those are delicious and I continue to eat them more frequently than I would like. <laughs> Why is this, right? This place didn't teach me to be smart. This place taught me to research. This place taught me to interrogate everything. I don't just eat an idea without sniffing it first anymore. I make sure that it's come from a place that is going to be enriching me, be enriching my people. So this plowing has become difficult, and I, I don't have time. They told me I had five minutes. Somebody's probably gonna have to throw something at me to get me out of here before I, I complete my point, but I am gonna make my point today. Um, the plowing has become difficult for those of us who have been born late, in the late stages of what we now know to be racial capitalism. It has been difficult financially, but it has also been difficult in terms of how we interact with one another. There seems to be a lot less grace, a lot less forgiveness, a lot less open curiosity when we encounter others, and even when we encounter other kinds of ideas. A lot of you all came here with an idea of what you wanted to investigate in this place. Some of you, like me, may have come here just being like, I mean, I got a lot of questions. <laughs> I think y'all have a lot of books. And I used to think that I could get my, my questions answered by reading more and more books, if I could just really get up under the books, you know? Um, and then it just became a book fetish. And I, I've heard the words fetish spoken here already, so I'll, I'll, have, to, I'll have to inquire about that and see, again, if, if uh, investigation will be enriching there. Um, but it, was, it wasn't until I left this place 
until I left my graduate studies that I started to realize that there were things that I suspected um, but now know for a fact. One of those things is that there is no reliable hierarchy of a how you know. Let me make it, let me keep it, you know, real, real professional up here. Epistemological hierarchies, okay? How do you know something? Is it because you read it in a book? Is it because you felt it in your spirit? Is it because you saw a tear fall down someone else's face when you spoke a word that you thought was harmless, and yet there that tear is, and that tear requires an explanation? You are curious people. Thank the heavens, you are curious people. We need more curious people. As my, my colleague, and I, I, I forgive me, may I call you my, my dear colleague, whom I, whom I, whose hand I just shook, but I was so moved by this connection being drawn between the search for knowledge and worship. The search for knowledge and worship. Last time I checked, God, whatever you may want to call God, is not limited to book time. <laughs> I would hope that if we are reading a sacred text, that we are reading it because we are not inside the text, but because we are outside the text, looking for something to help us in this plowing that we are doing on the outside of the text. For me to come here today, I had to use some skills that I gained, not only in this place, but also throughout my entire life. One of the skills that I used was that I drive crazy when I'm on the road. If you're from New Jersey, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, I'm sorry for you. We, we have a good time. Uh, <laughs> but I also had to use my self-soothing mechanisms when I discovered that I was going to experience a 20-minute delay on my way to this place. And I knew that y'all was going to be starting on time. I knew the University of Chicago didn't play around like that. So I'm here trying to get here, and the, the frustration could build, but there was nothing that I could do about the outcome. It was going to be what it was going to be, and I was going to arrive when I was going to arrive. And the only decisions I had to make were uh, in regards to how sweaty I was willing to become on my way here. <laughs> Pretty sweaty, apparently. I, I actually really cared about this event. <laughs> so I'm very sweaty right now, right? But it's okay, I didn't die um, as a result of this. And I started to really ponder it because it is in these spaces of anxiety. And I know you all have, well, let me just ask you, let me stop telling you what I know about you. I, I mean, I know some of you because it takes a long time to do an advanced degree, but <laughs> how many of you ever felt anxious while you were working? Whether you're a grad or not, graduate or no. See, you know, anxiety is real. Um, quieting that anxiety improves the quality of my work. It improves the quality of my presence. It improves the quality of my showing up to plow said field. It's very difficult to plow the field when your eyes are full of tears and you feel like your back is going to break because you don't think that you can do it, you don't think you can accomplish it. I may never see a stock portfolio. I may never see, you know, uh, a day where I don't have to engage in uh, rice and peas and, you know, other things that, <laughs> that some of us have been eating for generations because that's what we've got and we had to make it delicious. So this um, knowledge about how to calm myself, how to soothe myself was not coming out of books. This knowledge of, you know what, you are more important than what you produce. You are more important than the number of hours you spend at a job. You are more important than the number of publications you, you create. You are more important than the buzz you generate online with a post. You're more important than likes. You're more important even than everybody needs to like me. I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> everybody don't need to be pleased. That's an aside, but you don't need to please everybody. It's okay. Like some people don't deserve that. Some people don't deserve you. But let me return to this field that we are attempting to plow under such conditions. 
I was invited as an alumni speaker. Now, you know, I didn't even know that because I was like, I'll go anywhere. You want me to talk, talk about something? Yeah, I could be here for, you know, a whole day probably. I'll do a conference by myself. Uh, <laughs> but what I did want to make sure to leave you all with was what I have learned about the ways in which the mind, that life of the mind, when it is not considered to be part of the body, is a unnecessarily painful life. It's one thing to be in pain for a good reason, right? You ran into a burning building to save somebody's baby. That's a good reason to be in pain. It's not a good thing to be in pain because you believe that your, your mind and, and your brain matter are not the same, or at least that they don't intersect heavily. This, what this means is that, that, that level of importance I was just giving you, that you are an important and valued and necessary person, is not about the books. It's not about what you know. It's just because you're here. So please give us the icing, but don't give us the icing on the cake at the cost of your health. Don't give us the icing on the cake at the cost of your relationships with your children your relationships with your spouses, your relationships with your friends, even your relationships with strangers. Why? Because all of these are epistemological moments. All of these are moments of opportunities for worship, opportunities for knowledge, opportunities to pick up something. One of the uh, things that I've most valued and appreciated about my work uh, with undergraduates is the way that they have given me a, a whole other education. The assumption that someone has nothing to teach me, the assumption that something has nothing to teach me, is not only hubristic, it's wrongheaded. And guess what? It's not rigorous. So um, from coming here in the first place and experiencing the culture shock and trying to figure out how to fit in the African-American vernacular English that I grew up in, that was my language, uh, and, and blend it with what I loved about so-called standard English as just at a base level. Um, I, 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 I wish, and I, I know now that I'm on that journey too, I wish that every place I'm in, I will just be me. I will just be me. I don't get to wear this so often, you know. <laughs> if I wanted people to be like, oh, professor, oh, oh, you know, I could just wear this, you know. But when I take it off, I should hope that I could just be me and in the aggregate so that I can continue to hold on, so that it is sustainable. We do not have any energy to waste on pretending. We don't have any energy to waste on trying to fill ourselves with things that are not going to make us full. I hate to break it to you, but you can't read all the books in the world. Sorry. I've tried many times. I continue to try, you know, but I'm a fool. I shared keep your hand on the plow because, as I said, I know there are reasons reasons, real reasons why you came here. There are things that you care about very deeply people and causes. I want for you to press on into those things, knowing that you are not only equipped with the training and the skills development, but also that those are not the only skills you have. You have other abilities that you came here with, that you will leave here with, and that I hope you will continue to strengthen throughout your life. It is a skill to hug someone when they're down. It is a skill to speak truth to power. It is a skill to say, I am who I am. I am a non-binary person. I am who I am, regardless of what is going on around me, regardless of how hard the work is. So, I mean, the work of being yourself is, which I mean, I hope y'all knew that. Hold on. 
you're good at holding on because you made it here and you're dressed up. That's how we know. You know, you look cute. That's how we know you can hold on. But I want you to keep holding on. And I want you to see this not as the end of something that is over, but as part of the stream of your life. Pay attention. There is learning everywhere. The field is very difficult. Sometimes it'll plow, the plow will go without you, but you've got to hold on. Health first, love first, relationships first, care first, and value yourselves and others first. Hold on, hold on. keep your hand on the plow, hold on, hold on, hold on, keep your hand on the plow, hold on. Sing it with me if you know it. One more time. Hold on, ah, hold on. Keep your hand on the plow. You hold on. Congratulations, class of 2023. It's the Michael Jordan year. Do it big. Uh, thank you, R.L. Uh, thank you, Professor Watson. Thank all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, graduates. Thank all of you in the audience who have come here. Thank all of you in the virtual world out there uh, viewing these, uh, these uh, celebrations from somewhere else. Before we depart, uh, we have a little time, and I'd like to avail myself of this opportunity to address a few words to you, honored graduates, as you complete your intense period of academic work. Uh, described so perfectly by R.L. and by uh, uh, Yusuf as well. Uh, this time that you've had here has required from you a time of withdrawal from the world, of separating yourself from previous circumstances, isolating yourself from the rhythms of daily life, devoting yourself individually and with community to a critical examination of first thoughts and undigested theory, especially over the last few years. You enrolled in a full complement of courses, took exams and wrote papers, argued theses, criticized your many received opinions, and innovated others. For those of you who have completed the PhD, you have created something new, your first book, uh, the first perhaps of many. You have created original scholarship, something new that no one has done before. You have discovered and explored new data, developed a new understanding of an old problem, like the proverbial hedgehog in Aesop's fable and Isaiah Berlin's use of it, you have burrowed in. This is the type of training you have done over the past several years, digging deep, putting down roots, finding your space and exploring it, setting your feet, testing your theories, grounding your thoughts, securing your place in the world of ideas. One can also draw from the world of Plato and the Platonists to describe the discipline of scholarship you have trained in over the past several years. Many philosophers from the past held the belief that our soul, what makes us who we are, is preexistent. It comes to us fully formed, comes from the world of spirit, descends into our bodies, then promptly forgets everything it once knew. What life is, a life of learning, is remembering, recollecting, recovering the knowledge and wisdom you once possessed as you work to free the soul so it can return to its original home in the world of spirit, the world of ideas. These ancient sages spoke of a downward way, the soul descending into body, and an upward way, ascending, elevating, purifying oneself of the difficulties in life, returning home. As I close this ceremony, a ceremony celebrating your successful residence here within the complicated world of ideas, I would like to leave you with one more authority from the past, one who has meant a lot to me over the years. At the end of a learned treatise from the 12th century, the philosopher Moses Maimonides pondered this idea of ascent towards knowledge and presented it hierarchically. 
There are four possible human perfections, he mused, a perfection in health, a perfection in wealth, in morality, and of the mind. And what's, what it means to be human, so he suggests, is to pursue a life of learning leading to intellectual perfection. That, however, is not where the book ends, uh, quite intriguingly. Where it ends is with a fifth perfection, though not clearly marked off, a perfection that is something more, not knowledge simply, knowledge in the simple sense, but knowledge put to work, not just ascending the ladder of wisdom, but going down to share knowledge and apply wisdom. After reaching the life of the mind, uh, so Maimonides concludes his magnum opus, one ought to move towards helping others, sharing insights, leading your community to a better place. To repeat his remarkable conclusion, you should not only acquire knowledge, you must put your knowledge to work. And so I end by adding this Maimonidean exhortation to the university creed mentioned earlier and to the many wonderful uh, remarks uh, presented to you during this festivity. Continue to grow in knowledge, continue to grow knowledge, put it to work for the good of the world. Congratulations, class of 2023.